This is lecture 12. Uh, blogging. Uh, if you have, you might have noticed some of you have had your posts put up. I remember you recognize your face. I'm putting up little little pictures of people's faces as they go up. Ew! Sorry, people were going to see you during life. Um, I don't know, go complain to the university about your profile photos. The people that's like, photo not available, I'm going to put interesting stuff. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. So, um, there's been some very good feedback from other readers on the blog. Obviously, I encourage you guys to leave comments for each other because most of my readers don't talk about opportunity costs and marginal costs every day, so you guys should know more about that. Um, and uh, um, what is it? There's about 10 of them posted so far. There'll be two every day until I run out. So um, that's some cool stuff. Uh, office hours. Normal hours today. Not on Thursday at all. I'm going to be out for a medical thing and hopefully I will not die and I'll see you guys next Tuesday. And on next Tuesday I'll have double time office hours. Um, probably from, uh, you can start at 12.30. Does anybody have any idea besides 12.30 till 2.30? Does anybody have any preference for a different hour? Well, the midterm will be next week on Thursday. After four. After four. Anybody else for after four? Hold on. Let's do a vote. I know, all night. Let's see. One thirty. <laughs> Two thirty versus uh, four thirty. Is this Tuesday? This is Tuesday and Tuesday only, okay? This is my office hours. The, the uh, GSIs are doing other office hours. Four thirty, five thirty, is that the nomination for the afternoon? Okay, afternoon. Wow. Maybe we should just move. Should I just cut this off as the, the first hour and put it all into the afternoon? Yeah. No. Okay. This one here, this extra hour here. Nobody cares. Okay. So I'll do one at. Oh, oops. I can't even hear. Twelve thirty. I'll have one at twelve thirty, and then I'll have another office hour four thirty. Yeah. Okay. Great. If it turns into a review session, I don't have any problem with that. Um. Okay, so uh, your homework is due on Thursday, homework two. I looked up in, in case there was like joy and not showing your face. Any questions about homework two? Three. Three? Three. Uh, three. C. 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 What about what? What's uh, three C said? You could do marginal stuff? Ew. Is that using the labeled areas in both graphs here? Oh, okay. This one here. Oh, that's awesome. That's so easy. I'm not even going to help you with that. Help each other. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. About other stuff that's not related to homework? Yeah. Can we get some sort of study guide for the term? No. What we talked about. Um, I have thought of some very devious ways of making sure I ask you questions about everything that you are supposed to have read, right? That's Hayek, those are the guest lectures, okay? So, uh, and those people who are asking about uh, YouTube lectures being posted, uh, I don't have very much control in terms of when they show up on YouTube. I have done my job, my side of things, in terms of getting them to ETS. So, it's up through, uh, the video lectures are up through, I think last week was not posted. Does anybody know? Anybody care? The audio is always posted, as far as I'm concerned. Um, any other stuff? Yeah. Will we go over the readings, especially in the class, or will we at least discuss it and talk about it? Most of the readings are on your own. Okay, so Yeah. Uh, if I ask you something, then it should be a pretty bloody huge. No, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't mean in terms of for the. The term. I ah. just meant as a general as a gen interest discussion. <laughs> uh, Hayek is obviously coming up off and on, that information paper. Um, and uh, when we do, I don't even know if I, what did I saw? It was Coase. Coase, yeah, Coase, Hardin, and Gordon. We will talk about those. I will talk about those in lecture. And if uh, the GSIs decide to do it in, in their uh, discussions, that'll be fine. 
the Gordon, the Gordon, and, and uh, in fact, all all three of those pieces, Gordon, Post, and Harden, are pieces that address the issue that you guys learned about when you did the experiment with the fishery, with the candy. Remember that kind of wiping out the fishery example. These, all these three guys are talking about the theory of overcoming those kinds of uh, tragedies and commons. And, and of course, the, the Logic of Collective Action, the book that you will be finishing after the midterm, as in starting after the midterm, yeah, by the mid-November, by Thanksgiving, that book addresses that same topic. So we're going to have a lot of time on group dynamics and things like that in that kind of game theory. Is that a good answer? Other question? Yeah. You mentioned we need another paper, but what about the novels? Will they be on the test? Uh, yep. Okay. In the sense of you should have read them, and yeah. the question I asked will be so big that if you read it, you won't have a problem. Yeah. Okay. If you didn't read it, you'd be like, whoa, what's this economic stuff? Okay. Yeah. Wait, is it more like work or is it more like like the lecture is chaos. Um, <laughs> no, there'll be uh, there'll be some there'll be some problems that look a lot like the homework and there'll be some problems that don't. But it will not be essays, because it's impossible to grade essays very quickly. So I mean I'm just in, in deference to my GSI's life expectancy. I'm not that. What questions do you think I take uh, probably an hour and twenty minutes of the questions. Any other questions? No? Okay. You can never, you just show up, you take it, it's done, right? Okay. It's uh, just like everything else. Right, so I listened to Claire's talk uh, in order to create devious questions for you uh, and uh, when I, over the weekend. And um, what are the things that, she, what are the two things she said are necessary for markets? Two things, oh. What question? Uh, hand? Yeah. What'd you say? Um, property rights. Okay, that's a good one. But someone's had a question in the audience like, uh, you have to have a legal system, which is like you have to protect the property rights, but definitely property rights and? Difference in value. Difference in value. Is that what you're saying? Okay, great. Um, and then what's the thing that, do, that can inhibit or destroy a market from, from showing up? Sorry? Transaction costs. Transactions costs, right. Yeah, it's just too hard to, like, some, I was actually uh, moving this weekend. I, if I stumble a lot, it's because I haven't been sleeping very much. But someone, my, my, the guy who was helping me roof, I said, I had, oh, I have these three extra cardboard boxes. He says, oh, put them on Craigslist for free. I was like, no, I'll just put them on the curb, right? I mean, the transaction cost of me putting on Craigslist to get a phone call from somebody who's going to come up to my place and get three empty cardboard boxes was unbelievable, right? Forget it, my time. Ooh, it's a photo of the cardboard box you can get for free. So I just put them on the curb. So that is where I didn't have a market transaction. Or even worse, I could have tried to sell them for a dollar, and then you know someone's trying to find me to spend a, to spend a dollar, right? So transaction costs, and in, in a kind of a vague sense, there, there's a big category. You could put, like, like utility, you could put a whole bunch of stuff into transaction costs. Uh, but that can inhibit uh, the formation of the market. Uh, now, she mentioned something um, uh, about market failure or government failure. What, did she mention government failure or did she mention market failure? Does anybody remember what she mentioned? If you don't remember, what is market failure? Somebody tell me what market failure is. It's very popular in the political classes to talk about market failure. What does it mean when a market fails? You know? You don't know. The market never fails for you. What does it mean when a market fails? Inefficiency, but what kind of inefficiency? Okay, keep going. Is that like a monopoly kind of inefficiency? Not necessarily. Okay. Ah, that's called a business failure. I'm not going to go with that one. A missing, a missing, not, not exactly. It's kind of like missing market and stuff like that. Uh, let me, let me try and. Um, uh, okay, the thing to keep in mind.
is this difference, private versus social cost. So if I'm talking about private versus social cost, what does it mean when we have a market failure? And, and people who have their hands up, keep them up if you want to. Yeah. Uh, externalities exist that result in people not paying the full cost of their actions. Perfect. Externalities exist. Now, what does that mean, externalities that exist? It essentially means that if we have our aggregate demand curve here, and we have, let's just say that we have this supply function, okay? And let's call this the marginal cost of gasoline. Okay, externalities exist because the consumption of gasoline produces some uh, a byproduct that is not reflected in the cost. So the, the pollution, so gas equals, uh, uh, let's just call it go, right? You get to go, right? But it also produces pollution. So the, the consumer who's buying gas will say, oh look, the price of gas is whatever, $3 a gallon, and I'm going to buy as many gallons as I want to go. Right? So this is, this, this is actually a Q star. Right? Now if there's a cost of pollution, does that mean that the supply curve should be lower or higher? In terms of the additional cost of pollution from using gasoline. Higher. There's this additional cost on top here. Let's make it like this. I mentioned last week that someone said that the cost of a barrel of oil should be $300 if you reflect military spending and geopolitical risk. Not geopolitical risk, sorry, military spending. Right? $300 versus around 100 and... What's the oil at now? 80 or 70? So, a much bigger number than the current price of 80. So, if we have this additional cost that means that every unit of gasoline out there that's consumed creates some pollution. Okay. Now, if there is nothing going on, there's no regulation, there's no intervention, then the quantity produced is going to be Q star, and there'll be this much pollution produced, and this is going to be inefficient, an inefficient quantity of consumption. Because if we did want to, if we did reflect the entire cost of consumption, we would want to have, uh, let's just put it at $4. We would want to have a gas price that was higher. Okay, I'm just putting in $4. This is not an actual quantitative, quantitative measurement of how high it should be. But more importantly, the quantity, um, I'm going to put a little E for efficient, would be lower. More, so it's the idea is that if you consume Q star, you're producing pollution. If we take this pollution to, into account by setting an efficient price, then the quantity consumed would be lower. And that would fix what's called, the, what, that would fix the so-called market failure. Okay, that's just this kind of a straightforward explanation about what market failure means. Does that make sense to you guys? What does the, the word failure mean? A failure to achieve the efficient outcome, right? So in fact, this is, although this might be a perfect equilibrium here, it is the inefficient equilibrium, right? And that's because of this, essentially this social cost of consuming fuel. Now, you can have um, market failure um, for, in different ways. One of them is, for example, pollution that produces a public bad. Another one might be that, um, uh, so, so that's uh, the public bad is an externality. Uh, when it comes down to the externality falling on a particular individual or an identified group of individuals, and the cost, the cost is being borne by those individuals. So it's not necessarily a public bad. Um, I have to talk about property rights so that we have this diagram. Uh, but say that it's a private bad that occurs to one individual, then there's actually the possibility of not having a market failure, but having a, well, in a sense, overcoming the market failure in a, in a bilateral way, in the sense that, um, so say that 
this is an overview kind of concept I'm giving you. We're going to be coming back to this a million times. But let me give you two examples. So one example, you've got your donut shop, House of Donuts, okay? And they're producing pollution, and this is uh, a public bath. So we want to tax their consumption of frying oil or something like that, right? <clears throat> this requires some form of government or some form of social intervention, coordinated intervention by a government body, because the public bad is accruing to every member of the public. It's to everybody. This, and, and, it, and this scale, we're talking a scale that is essentially in a transactions cost perspective, it's too hard to find every person who's being harmed. Too expensive, right? So you could have a public bad that's um, in a town in, in in Berkeley, and there's you know whatever several you know tens of thousands of residents. They're all suffering from this donut pollution. But or it could be on scale of California, scale of the United States, scale worldwide. What's the worldwide biggest uh, public bad going on right now? Greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases. Thank you. Loud voices, right? So greenhouse gases, uh, or uh, and a result, as a result of that climate change, everybody's pointing the finger at everybody else. This is a market failure, and now we're trying to solve it with a government intervention, and maybe we're experiencing a government failure, but that's, a, a, that's what this debate is all about. Could you have consumer-driven um, like adjustment for market failure? Like the other day at the store, I saw a carbon neutral bottle of water, so they just bought carbon offsets. So would that kind of be a similar thing? Was working toward it? Yes. That's essentially it's a voluntary tax that the bottle, that particular bottle of water company is uh, engaging in to offset the harm of buying their product, which is kind of like the bullet manufacturer sending, giving you an insurance policy for when you shoot your friend. I. Um, and Fiji Water does that. In fact, I think Fiji Water is so green, they double offset their carbon footprint, which is, of course, water that's coming across the Pacific Ocean. But, um, yeah, that's, I think, I, I call that marketing. Uh, I, if it actually works as advertised, it might be a, a way of overcoming that externality. I, I, I kind of hesitate because, um, Remember, this thing is about cutting consumption down, right? So, if um, if your demand function, oops, or whatever that was, if you're um, if you have a let's call it a very inelastic demand, and you raise the price by this much, then um, you're not reducing the quantity by very much, and oh, I can actually just go like this: a, very, a totally inelastic demand, right? And a totally inelastic demand is called, I don't care about that price, okay? If you don't care about that price differential, then you actually don't <coughs> consume any less. So that's accomplishing nothing in terms of reducing consumption. It is, however, generating this block of money, which is theoretically going to do something good, right? Which is supposed to, the block of money is supposed to offset the exact same amount of harm. And if the harm is greater or less, that's not, that's not the issue, but that's what they're shooting for. Right? But I'm, I'm not a big fan of what I call indulgences, the idea that you buy your water and then you, buy, you pay a dollar extra so you can not feel guilty about throwing your bottle of water, right? your, 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 your empty bottle or whatever. Uh, a good example. Okay, so this is a, a, the public bad from a, an externality, but what happens if the, the donut store just starts dumping oil on um, the neighbor's lawn? Is that um, a market failure? No. Is that an externality? Yeah, it's an externality. Yes. There's Do no we need a government system. intervention to fix this? Yes. What kind of government intervention? <coughs> property rights. Let's, let's, yeah, we got, pro oh, property rights. Okay, we got that legal system. Here's, here's our, our Berkeley farmer who's upset about the donut oil spilled on his garden. 
and there's government, and the government shows up and says, we want to intervene and help you. What, what kind of government intervention is going to happen? What's, how, does this, how does this get fixed, this problem? Or maybe it doesn't. Maybe you just have oil on the lawn. Anyone else? Come on. Who hasn't talked yet? You should pick on people. I'll start bringing the duck if you're not careful. The, the back, yeah. Fine. What? You got a fine? A fine. The fine. Where does the money go for the fine? Does it go to this guy? Nope. Oops. Wrong way. Goes to Sacramento. It's wasted. Yeah. Can you sue? Can you sue? Who's suing? The guy suing. This guy. Is that right? In a sense, he can sue. All right. This is what the Coase paper is about. The problem of social costs. Coase basically says. In the absence of transactions costs, an amazingly <coughs> significant caveat, right? People who are involved in pollution can make agreements, side agreements, based on property rights to uh, mitigate the cost of an externality. All right? You'll read the paper, he says it a little bit longer than what I just said, and probably a lot better. But the idea basically is, who has the property rights here? What's natural? Who's, who's the one that has the property rights? The donut polluter or the farmer uh, blue tea? Farmer, the right, the right to not be polluted on, essentially, right, or not to have someone jump crap on your on your road, on your on your land. So who, so the, the rights, the rights belong to the farmer. Here comes this oil. The farmer has the right to say what about the oil? Yeah, and so the oil guy does he have the right to? Prohibit, does, it, who, does he have the right to not be polluted or the right to, or does the donut guy have the right to pollute him? Not be polluted, right? It's fairly common sense, and, and there's lots of different ways of, of structuring this, but it's fairly common sense that you have the right to not be polluted, right? You bought your land, it did not involve an easement for donut oil flows. So if this guy's got the rights, then he basically could say, you shut down. Now this guy, he's going to do what? He gets to, what's he going to do? Is he going to just shut down his business? No. What are his options? What can he do? Right, put it over here. What else? Right, no dumping. Change technology, right? That's the delta for change. And changing technology implies using a higher cost method, right? Because if it was, if there was a lower cost method that did not involve pollution, he would have done it already, right? So costs will go up. Uh, yeah. Pay the farmer to ask him for oil. Pay the farmer uh, essentially uh, a side payment, right? That's what Co said. Other hands? Yeah. Pay, um, yeah, let's see, pay to pollute. Pay to pollute, that's actually the words that show up in the newspapers all the time. And uh, for, I'm going to put um, clean up as a, that's a, it's a similar idea, clean up and change technology. That actually is going to raise costs, right? In other hands, that's pretty much it. This is the one that Coase talked about. This is what happens a lot. Especially in the developed, this is no so-called pollution havens, pollution dumping. This is what ends up happening if this is too expensive, right? If three costs more than two, the usually the in a law-abiding society, this isn't going to happen. But two or three ends up being the kind of result. Okay? Somebody wakes up in the morning and says, "Oh my God, there's all this oil here," or "Oh my God, there's carbon in the atmosphere," or "Oh my God, there's um, smog." Right? Let's fix this problem. And either you go to paying people to pollute or paying to, to do that kind of activity or changing the technology. And it, it's, there's almost, there's a, a, a literal, uh, it's a business trade-off between which one you decide to do. Okay? We're going to be getting into this a lot because it's a big, big topic in environmental economics, but I wanted to bring it up uh, in terms of um, what got tingled on the first stock. Yeah. So is it assumed that that is then the most, or then that will fix the market value and everything will be efficient after, for example, he pays the farmer to put or cleans up? 
Everything will be efficient if these two are in negotiations with sufficiently low transactions costs. Then, That's what Coase said. But then, in that case, so let's say they agree on the deal, he pays him $100, the cost of his donuts go up. Then people are unhappier because now they don't get cheap donuts. And it sounds ridiculous with donuts, but for example, with cars, it's mm -hmm. very real. Because, right. So then can't you say that's also inefficient because now... No, it has nothing to do with inefficient. The price is the price. The price reflects costs, right? So some of the costs before were not being reflected in the price of those donuts. <laughs> Isn't there a social cost of unhappiness of people who now can't go from place A to place B? And yes, but away? everybody can complain about that. I'm unhappy. I don't have a one dollar Mercedes. I'm very unhappy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that wouldn't count then, like what no, you're saying. No, no. That's just like that's. So what we do when we do supply and demand is we just say, hey, this is the surplus here, right? But we want to make sure that supply and demand are accurate representations of what's going on. So this is, in a sense, the supply curve should have been shifted up and in. Other questions? <coughs> yeah. I have a related question back to the externality graph. Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> I'm just thinking, what, what is the goal of, say, a government group that wants to impose a tax? Right. Like, like do they look at the elasticity and think, OK, we want to you know, impose a tax so that the quantity goes down to a certain amount and the tax we collect is equal to the damage done by the quantity? I mean, like, what is, what is the goal? Well, that's the theory. So let me take us an aside. I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about this later, but now is the time. Let me talk about um, taxes versus regulations. Okay. So you've got your. Uh, let's call it a benevolent group, a, a kind of uh, citizen group, and they're interested in ending. The such and such a source of pollution. So um, let's just let's just take our demand curve, and here's a supply curve, and here's what uh, supply efficient, and here's supply um, market failure. Let's call it that. Okay. So now there's Here's the theory. The theory is, is they want to impose a tax that will uh, be identical to the cost so that the market transactions are efficient. That's the goal. Okay? So this amount here is the tax. And so this is all tax revenue. Oops. And the tax revenue. More importantly, I mean, you could, you could either take it as the area under under this sloping curve or, or as the whole box here, right? You can take it either way. But that revenue is meant to offset the costs of the pollution. So in the, in the example of uh, climate change, uh, we will tax carbon and we will use the tax revenue to... Um, you know, reforest areas or do carbon sequestration or whatever. So that's a, a very important thing. What happens to the money after it goes? There's some uh, interesting controversy about uh, controversy in U.S. politics about carbon tax or about uh, taxing the cap and trade regime. And this is this is different than ta cap and trade, by the way. But the idea is that if there's some revenue, it should be used to uh, uh, fund green programs, to increase energy efficiency, what they call a double play, right? You tax them to reduce the activity, then you subsidize the virtuous activity. Um, and, then, and then don't you have to then place a value on the, the damage that's going on? Oh, absolutely. That's the size of the tax, right? Calculating that is the alchemy, right? It is very hard but to calculate. Like, is that a little kind of flawed idea? It's a, it's a flaw in the ointment. <laughs> flaw in the ointment. Well, the, the idea, the theory is, is sound. We should make it cost more. How much more? You know, well, what if this is... Okay, let me draw this a second again. You know, what if, if this is the, the market supply curve, and then our, our, our price is here, and then we have uh, one of our geniuses calculates uh, this number here, and says that's the tax, but it really should be bigger, right? If it really should be bigger, then we have an inefficiently high level of pollution. If it really should be smaller, then we have an inefficiently high level of taxes. Right? So pinpointing that exact tax is, um, 
I think actually impossible. I'll just say impossible. But that doesn't mean they're not going to try. And more importantly, I think the idea is that you want to, I mean, I'm a big believer in, in terms of feedback loops on taxes. So if you, if you have a targeted level of emissions or pollution or water quality or air quality, whatever, if the activity is still producing too much of that bad, you just raise the tax. So the tax will go up and down according to how much of your bad is going on. And then you don't have to be so precise about your calculation on the first go. That's called Bayesian updating for the statistical uh, geeks in the room. I have no idea how to use it, but I just know it's called that. So, um, now the alternative <coughs> is a regulation, right? The regulation looks at this same example and says... Well, forget that tax stuff. Let's just make people use less. <coughs> right? We'll, we'll have a limited number of permits or rights to consume this item. We can call this anything. It could be called gas, it could be called carbon, it could be called um, uh, housing developments, uh, parking licenses, any of those things. Okay? So, this is the worst diagram ever. I hope you're not just like copying it down. Make good notes, though, about this diagram, right? The idea is that you regulate what? Quantity. You regulate quantity, and over here, you're regulating on price. That's actually the big difference between these two ideas. Now, there's other types of regulation called, you're not allowed to do sell leaded gas, you have to sell unleaded gas, but the idea is essentially similar. Um, so if you regulate the quantity, then do you still sell it for the old price? Or? You regulate the quantity and then you wash the price, whatever happens to the price, right? Because in, in market equilibrium, you can set price and quantity will be an outcome. Or you can set quantity and price will be an outcome, but you can't set both. This is actually extremely important because very few people besides economists, and by that I mean you guys, understand that you can't set price and quantity at the exact same time. Right? I did my, my dissertation about this, uh, the Metropolitan Water District, and they try and set price and quantity a year ahead of the market. And then they hope that this happens. They hope. Right? They don't actually know what supply or demand look like, but they try and set price and quantity. So that's kind of, you know, it's, it's good employment for economists. They're doing all these estimates for them, but they're wrong almost all the time by definition. So, in, in, in regulation, you're either messing with Q or you're messing with P, taxes. Yeah. Is there a deadweight loss associated with uh, regulation? I know there's for both, but because taxes, the, there's actually a revenue that goes to the government. Right. Whereas regulation, it just doesn't happen. Right. Regulation is, uh, that's a, a, a very important and correct observation. The taxes produce revenue. Um, this box here, Okay, so this tax, there's P, there's the tax. This tax, does this have any impact on social welfare, that tax? Who thinks yes? All the way up there, pull those over, go ahead. Who thinks no? Well, all the yes people are wrong, and all people didn't vote are wrong. This has no impact on social welfare. The deadweight loss triangle, yes, that has an impact. This is merely a transfer. Okay? It's a transfer of surplus from producers, it's from their surplus triangle, and consumers, their surplus triangle, to the government, which will then do something very wise with that money. And it may not go back to either of these producers or consumers, okay? It's meant to go back to those who are harmed by the pollution. If it goes into the congressional junket to Bermuda Fund, then it may not all be wasted, but some of it will be wasted in terms of social outcomes. Yeah? In some sense, isn't the tax better than regulation because you support the of that money? In one sense, tax is better than regulation because the money is quantified. The deadweight loss is, is the same in both circumstances. But in this circumstance, you're just inhibiting activity, right? And, uh, but more interesting is that 
taxes are much more transparent. When you see the tax, you see the tax. The regulation that you're not quite sure what's the extra cost, right? That, ironically, is why cap and trade is much more popular with politicians. Because they don't want taxes to be visible. And regulations, so the cost of regulations. I, I, there was someone who I, uh, uh, an assemblyman of California who I quoted in my blog, and he said, California has a, they have a cap and trade rule in California. I think it's called AB 32. And he said, yes, we know it's going to cost 100 times more than a carbon tax, but at least people won't see these costs. That was a quote from a politician, right? Now, that's even the benevolent side of the politician, right? Because if you're doing a tax, you realize, you realize that every unit is going to have a revenue associated. When you do a regulation, you can write those regulations lots of different ways, right? Ex exempting ranches that are greater than 100,000 acres located in Montana, Ted Turner, campaign donor, right? So regulations have a lot more uh, area for negotiation among politically active groups that do not include you, citizens, right? That's the special interest groups. Those are the lobbyists, the 60,000 DC lobbyists. But how can taxes not have an effect on Oh, no, they absolutely do have an effect on social welfare. I was pointing at this triangle here. That was the trick question, right? Okay, this is the deadweight loss. That's true, right? This is the, this is nominally not a deadweight loss if it is spent efficiently, right, to offset the actual cost. If it goes into the black hole of uh, corruption, then it's also a deadweight loss in a sense, right? That's why some people say just don't even have taxes, they'll just go have government, right? Yeah. In regulation, the producers just loses the money. Um, it just increases their costs, and in that sense, uh, they will. They're they're experiencing a higher supply function, <coughs> and uh, so there's the dead weight loss, right? And um, they're having so their 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 surplus. Let's see here. Their surplus was a. No, let's do this. Let's do this bigger. Because I, I do want to figure out what the producers are losing. So there's their original cost curve. There's the demand function. We essentially uh, let's just do the tax this way. But for regulation. Don't you, doesn't or the regulation, sorry. The price is, I mean, for regulation, why would the cost go up? Because they just say, okay, you can only produce, you can only sell that much. That's the end of it. They don't tax it, so the cost stays the same. It's just that now everybody who's in that market actually likes it because it's like a monopoly. They make the same stuff, but they can sell it for a higher price because there's less supply. And they say we're not allowed to make more. Right. Well, there's different ways of doing it, okay? So, the scenario you're talking about, we've got demand, we've got supply, and, they, and the government just says you can't sell more than that, okay? So now we have this supply function, it kind of goes like this, right? And you could have the price jump up just like you said, right? Um, And they lose, they lose A, they gain B. Consumers lose C and B in terms of their surplus. That's if you just cut it off. It's um, the problem is at that price, right? You've got all these guys that want to be producing for the market. So you have somehow not just a, this is. Not just to choke it down from Q, so you have to choke down supply, not just from Q star to QE, but you've got to choke out all these guys too, right? And some, in some wise and benevolent way, decide who gets to produce for that market. That is what comes into, or what I was mentioning about, about cap and trade. That's where you get the lobbyists showing up saying, ooh, give me the production license because uh, we have, or we print stuff on recycled paper. Right. So we need the million dollars of subsidy. Well, not subsidy, but market access. So this is this is very much a dynamic for regulation, right? What I was doing here was I was just kind of 
benevolently assuming it was going to happen and you know there was no lobby going on, right? So treating the regulation essentially just like a, a cost. But this is use this use this for the the deadweight loss of the regulation. Right? And the taxes are, are what I slept. Yeah. So the number of losses is This is a this is a C, but uh, yes, C and A. Also, why does it look like consumer surplus decreased? Consumer surplus decreased in this example. <coughs> yeah, consumer surplus used to be C plus B plus D, right? No, above, above the price, okay. consumer surplus. Is that the question you're asking? Oh, so producer is on the bottom. Producer. Producer's on the bottom. So, okay, why does it look like producer surplus is increased? It did increase, yeah, it did increase right? right? Because essentially the government, I mean, this is a different ways of doing regulation, but in this case, we're just cutting back on quantity, just like a monopolist would want to, right? This is why a lot of industries ask for government regulation. <coughs> Right? Please regulate us. Remember that please don't throw us in the briar patch? Yeah. Anybody ever seen that? What's that? Briar rabbit. Briar rabbit, briar rabbit, briar fox. Please don't throw me in that briar. Please don't regulate me. Oh no, don't regulate me. And then, oh, those regulations are wonderful, you know, because it keeps, usually it'll keep out an entry. It'll keep out competition. Okay? So then the producer surplus increases by the quantity B and falls by the quantity A. And B is, let's assume, greater than A. So why does it fall by C as well? This is, this is consumer surplus, just lost by the reduction in quality. Okay. Now, the, this, I mean, this segues perfectly into what I want to talk about with profits. Because um, in the short run, Short-run profits, are they greater than zero, equal to zero, or less than zero? Who thinks they're greater than zero? Equal to zero. Less than zero. Anyone? Anyone? Less than zero. Yay. Um, in some ways, they can be any of these. But the one that we talk about most often is that their short-run profits are positive. They can be equal to zero just because. Because um, you're adjusting. <coughs> Right? If you're a firm and you're adjusting your enterprise, you're like, oh my god, we're selling stuff below cost. We've got to raise our prices. That's just a fact of running a business. And they might be less than zero because of you, again, miscalibrate. But in economics, we almost always assume this. Right? We assume the short-run profits are greater than zero. Because of what phenomenon, typically? On business people. Why would short run profit be greater than zero? <clears throat> what happens in the long run? Let's start at the. Oh, go ahead. I guess if you have, um, if you're a firm and you're just starting out, and if your good is popular, then a lot of people will buy it. And it's before the time where other people want to enter that market. Again. Entry, right? Before entry. So long run profits equals zero. We assume in economics they equal zero because of entry. If there is not entry, Right? The long run profit of the post office, the 200 plus year monopoly, is greater than zero. <laughs> Although they continue to lose money. Okay? Now how they're using, so their financial profits might be negative, but their, their rents, their happiness, hanging around, drinking coffee, losing your mail, <laughs> those are greater than zero. Okay? Because there is no entry against the Postal Service in some segments. Obviously, we've seen they've lost packages, they've lost most first-class mail in terms of email. And a lot of business posts, right? But in the, for a competitive business, long-run profits are equal to zero because of entry. Because firms come into the market and will innovate to take away that profit from uh, Apple or the Duncan, not Duncan, uh, who's that? Cine, Cinnabons or whatever. These, oh my god, I can't believe I'm eating a cube of butter. That kind of stuff. <laughs> so that's, until somebody comes in and copies their business model, then that will uh, be positive, right? And it's important to keep in mind that there's two types, there's the 
There's a lot of there's a lot of things that are affecting these short run profits being positive. Let me allude, let me get to this one first, then I'll go to the other things on the list. One reason is that the, there's some form of regulation, some kind of law protecting your market share. Okay, you have got a temporary monopoly. You're a taxi driver in Berkeley, right? There's only a, whatever 120 medallions in Berkeley, and you can't start. There's no startups for taxi drivers, so you could have. Uh, a form of a regulation that's protecting your short-run profitability being uh, greater than zero. Um, it doesn't mean that, well, there could be competition among the taxi drivers, but that still will stop after a while and will keep profits positive. The other one is uh, it's essentially an out-of-equilibrium path. No one knows what's really going on, so profits are being made. Uh, technology is hard to catch up with. A local monopoly is quite important. Okay, A local monopoly is going to be when you have one donut shop here, and one donut shop here, and essentially the market, you know, if, if you're standing here and you're, and you're thinking, gee, I want a donut, right, maybe the transaction cost of going over here, well, let's just say it's greater than zero, right? If the transaction cost is greater than zero, can this guy charge you a higher price? Yeah, right? So. The profit is greater than zero. And likewise, over here, for people crossing this way, that's essentially a form of a local monopoly. Right? Now, uh, if the transactions costs fall so that you can instantly go from donut shop to donut shop and do price comparison, then that uh, monopoly profit will fall. I'm going to the airport today, and I'm going to experience the Starbucks airport coffee monopoly. Right? You go there, you can go through security, it's like it's not like you're walking out to get a coffee for a dollar less, you've got to deal with their prices. And I routinely notice that Starbucks costs a dollar more a cup after security, right? Or when there is not another concessionaire inside there. In fact, when I, my, my, my first and my only successful business in high school was selling candy. And there was a, a monopoly on campus selling candy bars for 50 cents. And the Dean of Students and I, we uh, conspired to defeat the monopoly. And I had my own little candy machine that wasn't supposed to exist. You know those little whirly things that spew out candy. Guess what my price was? 49. 49. Except that we don't do pennies, right? 45 cents, right? And, and I didn't exist. So that was perfect because they didn't know, they were setting prices at a higher level in order to reap in the monopoly profits, but they didn't realize that they actually had set a, a floor below which I could go and like take advantage of all of the student demand. I bought a car with that candy machine. Great deal. And I donated some of my profits for the students. I had changed the machine. Except when it was shocking people. There was a little bit of a problem with that machine. But it was <laughs> 45 cents and maybe a shock. Okay, so uh, profits. So in the, I had, this is not exactly like I had my profits protected, but I was, I was so there was, it was kind of like we were a duopoly, right? It was me and this other guy, except they didn't, the other guy didn't even know I was there, so I was actually undercutting his prices and taking some share of market uh, potential. But students would still buy, I was selling Twix bars, they would still buy that machine, the 50 cent Twix bar, when? When would they buy it? They couldn't? Convenient, right? They didn't have change with it. It's more convenient because, you know, this is only, I only had one machine. These guys had about 12 of them, right? Candy, candy everywhere. So, oh, I don't want to walk more than 20 feet to get my candy bar, then they would get the nickel. Where did you find the machine? It was on the, the student union. Any other questions about that? Yeah. Um, earlier you were talking about how um, the short-run profits are protected by like, other equilibrium paths. Yes. What is that mean? Yes. It mean uh, out of equilibrium path means that um, it, in the economic sense, it means that you haven't obviously you haven't gotten to equilibrium. Okay. And why have you not gotten to equilibrium? Potentially because not all the firms have entered the market yet, potentially because um, consumers haven't found the best bargain, for example. So there's a lot of reasons that you'll be out of equilibrium, and as I mentioned uh, a, a lecture or two ago, the world 
is out of equilibrium, right? Economists are the only people that really assume equilibrium because it makes the math easier. So that's uh, a statement that you should you should walk out of here in general. Yeah. <coughs> I don't know. You should go ask them. Accounting profit versus economic profit. Has any have any yogurt shops gone out of business in the last year? Yeah. Yes or no? Well, like we've all had to convert to like the kind where you buy it for us. But there's none of them that like sell. It. Like like in they don't sell it. They don't sell so what? <laughs> like in Pink Berry. Um, I'm sorry, it's like so well, but it used to be sold by like cups, like right. a cup size three dollars. Yeah. Now it's like thirty cents an ounce. So it's all by weight. Yeah, so now it's a lot cheaper, like across Berkeley. But not all of them do that. The yeah. city of Berkeley has a yogurt <laughs> price cap? <laughs> <laughs> or is it, is, there, is it now it's competition because it's transparent? It's what you're it's ah, okay. So that was that's a good example of adjusting to equilibrium, right? So someone switched over to, they probably had this pennies per whatever. Now, and they said, oh, and look at our competitor's cup, it costs three bucks. Or all the people were like, holy cow, look at that, right? Or free yogurt coupons. Any, any uh, yogurt firms entering the market? Yeah? Okay, so short run profits are still greater than zero, apparently. Someone still thinks it's worth starting a shop. And uh, there's, there's some shop in San Francisco, the cereal. Have you ever seen the cereal shop? We have cereal. Yes, we had it, right? Who would go to cereal at a store? You would watch TV and eat cereal. I don't get that. <laughs> but anyway, yogurt is still a profitable business. Um, okay, so the good side, if profits are greater than zero, it could be a sign of something good or a sign of something bad. All right, I put that in an inverted quote. It could be a sign of something good because you're witnessing creative destruction, right? You're witnessing competition, and that is essentially benefiting who? Consumers. In the long run, in the short run, it benefits who? Which producers? The ones who? No, forget tautologies. Which producers are benefiting from creative destruction in the short run? <coughs> the ones that have the awesome products, right? I mean, Apple is making a killing on the iPhone, right? Who's losing in the short run from creative destruction? All other phone companies. The other ones, right? The competition to uh, the remember the razor used to be the shit, and then like who cares about that? It was oh this phone yeah whatever. Can't check my email. So creative destruction is, is beneficial to some groups and harmful to others. So you know you know who is going to oppose it and who is going to favor it. If they can either and they'll oppose it. So Motorola might oppose it by saying, we have to have a regulation saying that you can't produce a phone if your company is named after a fruit. And, and then they'll send some money to their congressperson, right? But on the other hand, some firms will fail to deal with creative destruction because they'd rather just not do anything, right? That's being ever hopeful, ostrich sticking your head in the sand, or whatever, okay? So, and, and that's also called, um, um, something like, uh, What's it called? Product line cannibalism or something like that? A firm doesn't want to innovate to destroy its own product lines. This is a, a known problem. IBM had an issue. IBM came out with the, uh, Apple came out with a PC, but I, IBM came out with the PC, right? Around 1981, back in the day. <laughs> so the PC came out, and IBM used to sell mainframe computers. And the mainframe people did not want, or many, pe many computer people did not want personal computers because that would have done what? <coughs> Taken away market share. Taken away their market share, made their life harder, right? So the people that actually created the PC, were, it was created in a secret lab in Florida, right? IBM's from, from New York. And the, and the rest of the company didn't even know about it because if they had known about it, they would have squashed them in terms of internal politics. But for the company as a whole, the PC was an amazingly good product, right? So the, the executive said, yes, take uh, several million dollars to really afford and create this product. So there's opposition inside of a firm to innovation. Which lets me... Oh. Uh, I'll get, to, get back to the opposition inside of a firm uh, in a second. But let me... Uh, I'll just skip ahead of this stupid thing. All right, I'll go back to it. So the other, sorry? 
Um, I guess I had a question about monopolies. If you're, um, if you just have a product that beats out every, like, out competes everyone else, then how is it that, um, because I guess if you're, like, kind of on the way to becoming a monopoly, like, if you're beating out everyone else, then, like, how is it, like, some firms are able to do that and, like, other firms are not? Like, how are, like, some markets becoming competitive and others are? Give me an example. Um, well, like, with Apple, if, um, you have, because they have an iPod, like, everyone wants to buy it, and, like, the less, or the other, like, Zooms and whatever are just a lot less popular. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so it's, like, Apple, I feel like, is, like, on the path of becoming a monopoly, sort of. Mm -hmm. And, um, but if you have, like, another, where it's, like, a lot of, like, goods are, or, sorry, a lot of, like, companies are selling, like, more or less the same good, I guess that's, are they for the same purpose? Then so it's a, it's the question of commodification, I think, is what you're getting at, right? The idea that a product, a product line will just become a commodity after a while, right? The profits will disappear. So, um, um, what's an example of a product that became a commodity? Okay, so bottled water, in a sense. In the back, in the 70s or whatever, the only bottled water was Calistoga and Perrier, right? And they had, you know, a reasonable market share and... Uh, but it was all, it was like $2 for a bottle of water, and no one cared about drinking bottled water. And then, bottled water became a healthy thing, and the do all this, like, eight glasses of water a day, and a couple companies got into the bottled water business, and they were selling, um, uh, what's a, a heavy, uh, Evian, right? A big brand of still water. And people were like, ooh, Evian, $2 a bottle. And the, and the water companies were like, holy cow. I just read, actually, the other day, Nestle has a bottle, is opening a bottling plant in Sacramento, they're going to pay about a dollar per thousand gallons of water. So they can put it in bottles and sell it for about a dollar or two dollars a gallon, right? So talk about a profit margin, right? So and the, the the profits get eaten up in shipping the water around, the plastic bottles, all that crap. But basically, bottled water started off started to be this really kind of lucrative monopoly area, right? Or not monopoly, but, but lucrative in terms of profits. And then more and more firms came in. They said. If we just take water out of the tap and sell it to someone and make a fat profit, why won't we do that? And they did. They started bottling water everywhere. This guy in New York actually bottles New York tap water and sells New York tap water in a bottle for a dollar, right? Even though it costs like a penny. So uh, the commodification of bottled water that followed is now such that people go into Walmart and say, yeah, I'll take a couple cases of water. They don't care about Evian or Calisto, any of that shit. They just, it's a commodity now. So the profits in that business have sunk so far that at I, I, one point, the, the Walmart water, I think the profit per bottle is one penny, right? And we're talking about the, the cost per bottle might be whatever, 32 cents. So the profits have been really squeezed down to almost nothing. And that's what happens in, in competition, right? In competition, there will be short-run profits. There will be rents, right? But the good kind of rents, rents that are returns on innovation. In the long run, in the, in the other way, what's the other way of getting those, those rents, monopoly rents? How else do you do that besides competition and innovation? Using market or political power of lock competitors out of the market? Yes, I'm going to say uh, not market power, but political power. So let's talk about the difference between Profit greater, short run profit greater than zero because of market power or government power. Okay? Market power is going to be because you make a better widget. Okay? Your widget sells for more. Right? Government power is because the government bans all your competitors. It doesn't matter if you sell crap, you're the only business in town. Um, would, you, uh, would you put patents under government power? Um, patents are a form of government power that's using government power. They're often explained as a way of, of um, protecting uh, the short run profits to the benefit of society. And there's a, there's a, there's a, a question about whether or not that's true. There's a lot of debate among uh, economists and, and legal scholars about whether or not patents are good for society or not. They do protect profits, though. Is there an economic way to describe like, the So the question is, um, <coughs> are uh, profits... Um, oh, 
can you raise prices and get more demand, in a sense, right? Uh, did anybody hear about that iPhone app called I Am Rich? Yeah. <laughs> right? It was obviously, it was all fixed cost, right? Some dude sat in his living room and made a little gem, I guess. I didn't buy it. And it was sold on the Apple Store for I think $1,000 or $999. And the marginal cost of production was zero, right? And the entire point of having this thing, in terms of psychology, was I have so much money, I can waste it to buy a picture of a, a gem, I think it was, right? And there was demand for this product, right? And uh, they, the Apple Store, in their worst moves, removed it um, because of a customer complaining that he didn't actually mean to be an asshole when he hit buy. Or an idiot, or whatever you want to call it. But, um, but that's an example, I mean, if you sold the I am rich thing for $10, probably no one would buy it. But if you're obviously so wastefully wealthy that you could pay $1,000, then there's a demand. But is that, that's not necessarily irrational if it fits in, in my, and I look at this stuff as, as it fits into the, um, what's called the evolutionary psychology literature, which is that we have evolved to, to buy those so-called positional goods, the good that puts you in a higher position relative to somebody else, because of its direct connection with reproductive success, right? So I wonder if any girls bought that, right? Because the guy would be like, woo woo, and the girls would be like, woo woo, you know? So it's like the guys that rev their engines going by, the guy that buys the penthouse apartment, not the floor below. Those are positional goods to show how big and bad you are. Donald Trump buys billboards for his next girlfriend. Do you think art is an example of that? In a sense, art is an example of that, but art also has this extremely limited market. Uh, almost by definition, every piece is unique. So, and also art is in the eye of the holder. If somebody buys art just to show people how much money they have to waste, then that's exactly what's going on. If they buy art because they love uh, $16 million paintings of sunflowers, then it's aesthetics, potentially. So would you say that every product that is sold by brand, like for example, people are spending $200 on a pair of designer jeans that are made from the same fabric in the same shop by the same people right. as the Walmart pair of pants, right. is that just for status? They go for the position? They go, it's, it's not just status, but that's also branding and membership in the community. Right? I mean, the Pepsi and Coke are just like that. Drink Coke, you'll be cool, like all of us in the Coke commercial. Right? Or Pepsi, which is more cool for whatever reason. Right? So, People that are buying those colas, if, if they sold a cola in a plain can that didn't actually say Coke, or you had to drink it in your, on your own in a room, you know, <laughs> it would lose kind of its potency in a sense, right? In terms of that price differential between Coke and Safeway Coke. Because they're, as far as I'm concerned, they're very similar. So is that something where demand goes up, where the demand goes up or sloping? It's, it's, well, no, it's, it's not demand is sloping up. What's going on? Demand is the relationship between price and quantity, right? What we're doing here, are we, are we affecting, are we going up and down, moving up and down the demand curve, or are we shifting it in and out? What's shifting it in and out? Taste and preferences. So we're actually creating a preference for this bling cola. There's actually bling water, it has little gems and stuff. Right? So it's shifting the demand curve out. What if the sperm American is like run by the government? For example, like in the health care debate, a lot of senators are just more opposed to the public option and that's not like a scam. Um, really. like, yeah, yeah. So there's a big, uh, so this question is what if the firm is uh, entering, this is a little bit off topic, but it's on topic, so it's good. But it's like if the firm entering the, the market is actually the government, right? So if the government, and the government is already in the healthcare market through the, the Veterans Administration and Medicare Medicaid in some way. Uh, but if the, the, the complaint is that if there's a, a public option, then um, that will drive out um, private providers of either insurance or of medical care. And um, that uh, complaint ho holds some water. It, does, uh, it is valid. The number one reason it's valid is because of the possibility of cross-subsidy, using tax dollars to subsidize medical service, whereas the private businesses can't do that. It's, it's pretty well known right now that um, for every private dollar in medical costs, you know, the government, uh, so, um, whatever, 
call it three quarters. Right? Three quarters. The, the cost of public health provision might be three quarters the cost of private health provision. Let's just say. That's the argument. Right? Oh, so we should have, or, or drugs in the USA, US versus drugs, legal drugs, in Canada. Right? Oh, let's just go buy drugs in Canada and bring them back to the States. We'll save 25%. Well, that's kind of stupid because they both come from the same factory, right? The difference in those prices are because of the, of the system that those drugs are in. If you start bringing back these cheaper drugs in the U.S., you, you break down this system. And in this circumstance with the public and the private, what's going on is that the, the public provision of medical care is either implicitly subsidized through property taxes or financing discounts. You know, the government borrows money more cheaply than a private firm. Or it's explicitly subsidized in the sense that these guys, the private companies, if you have a, a, a hospital, a private patient will pay $100 for the procedure, the public patient will pay $50 for the procedure, and the cost is 80 right? There's a cross-subsidy going on between public and private. So that is the main complaint of those folks, if it's legitimate. If it's illegitimate, it's because they hate the government. That's different, right? But there's a legitimate economic complaint about that. Okay, that was a little side note. Where was I? So... The, the government power can support uh, monopoly profits that are greater than zero. And if that's so, we know that there's going to be businesses out there that are uh, lobbying the government for uh, protection. And the businesses don't always need the government to protect their profits. There's a, such a thing as an oligopoly or a cartel. And we'll get into that more in, as the quarter pro progresses, but the semester progresses. But I wanted to quote... Adam Smith, the uber capitalist, I might have said this, but I'm, going to, I'm just going to read it. It says, people of the same trade seldom meet together, even for merriment and diversion, but the conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public or in some contrivance to raise prices. Right? Adam Smith is basically saying, yeah, the invisible hand is awesome, but don't let those guys get in the same room with each other because they will conspire against you. I mentioned this last week in terms of cartels, but that's the... Uh, the, the gospel uh, from Adam. So uh, that's some stuff on profits. And um, now, I, so I was actually on this thing, I was trying to respond to something on Claire's talk. So she was talking about market failure versus government failure, right? What's government failure? That's what I was trying to get to. What does government failure mean? Yeah. No. <laughs> that is a macroeconomic failure, but I'm not gonna, that's not what I'm looking for. Would it be incorrectly pricing the externality um, in, in that case? Yes. In a, in, a, in a direct price sense, a tax sense. Is it something like a price, price floor or price ceiling? Right. A, a floor or ceiling is more accurate in the sense of a regulation. Okay? You can have, remember that market failure results in an inefficiently, an inefficient, the production of an inefficient quantity of a good, right? Or at the wrong price. Either way, you get supply and you get supply and demand crossing. So, if you've got um, this situation going on, you could have a market failure because the price should be higher. You could have a government failure, I mean, just anywhere you want. You could just say, this is the price here. And the government decides, well, the price, we're going to put a price ceiling on there, P upper bar, right? On that price ceiling, you've got this much supply, you've got this much demand, okay? So that's essentially the, the government has intervened somehow in that market, and, and, is, and is, uh, its intervention is producing uh, a higher price, uh, P, oh, okay, so this is actually a good point. Uh, so, it's that intervention is restricting the, the quantity available in the market because the government sets it at P1 upper bar. What's PT upper bar or PT bar? What is that? Why is that price there? Why is that the actual price? What does it mean? What does that price mean? Is it a restricted quantity? They did restrict quantity, but why is PT equals
What is P bar 2? What is P2? It's what people would be willing to pay at that demand level match with that supply? Not just what they're willing to pay, it's what they do pay. Okay? In order to have a balance between supply and demand, you've got to be able to choke demand all the way up the demand curve. Right? And you choke it, you know the price is set, what's, going to, what's P2 composed of? Anybody ever bought, uh, or I don't know if this is you, but remember they have these, every once in a while they have a, a rush for some kind of fad toy at Christmas, like Beanie Babies or whatever, and Cabbage Patch Dolls, and, you know, and the kids are like, if you don't give me this, I'm going to kill you, and the parents are like, <laughs> I mean, they have a movie, like Arnold Schwarzenegger was trying to find some toy or something, right? So what's P, what's this, what's this P bar 2 equal to? The government has restricted quantity demanded, quantity, quantity. They've restricted quantity by setting this cap, price cap. It is available at PT, but what is PT equal to? It's equal to cash plus transaction costs. What are those transactions costs? You're trying to buy the Beanie Baby. You go down to Toys R Us and what happens? Sold out. You go to Toys R Us in El Cerrito, sold out. You go to Toys R Us, you get on the plane, you go, you go to China. So what's going to happen is you're going to spend P2 in terms of waiting around, searching around, asking around. They're all transactions costs, okay? Information problems, timing problems. And it's, it's usually we just say we, we call that time spent queuing, right? Standing in line. The idea is that, yeah, it's only 10 bucks for a ticket, but you have to wait in line for four hours. So is it like the, how like football game tickets work? Yes. Student rush, free tickets if you get in line. Like, wouldn't a market, uh, government failure also be like if you thought that they were regulating something that they weren't actually regulating? Oh. Would that be another kind of failure? You, the demander, would think thought they're regulating it? Uh, yeah, I guess so. I mean. Example? Um, like, I, I buy gas. I think the government's fixing the problem with pollution, like that kind of thing. Yeah, or like, um, well, I can't remember what, I think it was like AIG we were talking about, we assumed that they were like insured, yes. AIC insured, but they actually weren't. Or um, that's a, I think that's a, that's a complication of regulation. I wouldn't necessarily call it government failure right off the bat, but it's, Let's just not call government failure, but that's that's important as an example of where regulation can really go sideways. If, you know, they think it's every. Yeah, it's a failure. Would P two be something like back to the football ticket? So you buy it for twenty five dollars, but it's sold out, and then like someone else has it for a hundred. Right. So would P two be different? Well, you, so you'll have two markets. You might have a secondary market for the tickets. Okay. That would just be a pure price market. When you're dealing with a scalper, there's no waiting in line. They're there. They want your money. Right. It's nice and simple. But that's they're queuing up. Or they're buying the tickets with these, these supercomputers right on the first second of sales. Or they know somebody Billy Graham presents or in tickets or whatever and they buy stuff on the back on the back door. There's a number of reasons. But then the scalper market is a relatively efficient stub hub and all that stuff. Um, I, I'm thinking about rent control. Uh -huh. um, let's say the transaction cost it takes you an extra three months to find an apartment. But once you're in, yes. it's safer. Yeah. Yes. So uh, once you're in, so this represents not... The, that represents, or this whole, let's see here, this is the dead weight loss. <laughs> this is the producer surplus. This is the consumer surplus, right? And this is a transaction cost, okay? This transaction cost represents the capitalized value, or the capitalized cost of finding that thing. So for those three months of waiting, um, you're going to be, uh, you'll get access to this price, but you're over the over the time, the relevant time period, you're paying this price. Now, if you stay in the apartment for 20 years, maybe you're going to make out, right? But then there's other kinds of opportunity costs. But in a sense, what we what we assume is that the consumers are going to pay a good chunk of surplus against that property, right? And it, and it, whether or not it's you know the break even for for search costs is one month or three years, that's but it's a good observation. Yeah. Other questions? Sorry, what was the question? This is producer surplus, right? This is consumer surplus. 
And this is essentially, I'm going to call it transaction cost, search cost. Yeah. So in that picture right here, where's the government price? The government is setting the price ceiling at P1. The total price that consumers end up paying is PT. P1 plus P2. Right. At PT, there's no longer a shortage because the cost is then the cost is then high enough to reduce, to reduce that demand. Absolutely. Okay, let me take a. Uh, oh, I was going to get back. Okay, I'll say one more thing. The theory of the firm we talked about last week. We talked about the the donut entrepreneur and the coffee entrepreneur. Mr. Donut and Mr. Coffee, okay? And the question was, should they merge into one firm, right? Now that's fine and, and simple and interesting. But this theory, this is just a, this is an ex, not an extension, but this is a, another angle of looking at firms. This question about the boundaries of the firm assumes that the firm is a monolith. It assumes that the firm acts as an individual, right? Now, who's worked for anybody for a wage? Okay. Did you notice that inside of that firm, loosely construed, did ever, was everybody on the same team with the same program? We're all in it together. We're all profit maximizing. You know, we're all we all have one objective function. Is that true, or were there some kinds of disputes inside the company about who's doing their job, or who's working hard enough, or who's a good manager and this manager is not producing much for the firm? Does anybody notice those kinds of dynamics inside of a firm? Okay, that's what I want to point out to you as an existing. Situation. So here we blow the circle up, and we've got you know a bunch of individuals, and they all have. So this is a profit maximizing firm. We assume that, but inside of that, we've got a whole bunch of profit max equals a function of u1, u2, u3, and so on for all of the utility functions of the people in that firm, right? The profits of the firm are the result of the, of the, out, the as a result of a negotiated outcome among all of the individuals working inside that firm. All of those people have their own objective functions. Yes, I want to get paid. No, I don't really want to work. Yes, I want to sell this product. No, I hate selling that product. Yes, I'll show up on Tuesday, but I'll never work on Wednesday. I don't like you, I like that person, and so on. Okay? All of those utility functions are interacting inside the firm, and there's this kind of mishmash, right? The idea essentially is we pay you, we want you to be a good employee, so you have good, you have extrinsic motivation and intrinsic motivation, and that will produce a profit. But sometimes those uh, utility functions are in conflict, and the firm profit may not be as high as a result of that. Okay? I want to point that out, and we'll get to it. Very heavy duty on principal agent stuff, and I'll see you on Thursday. Homework due at the start of class on Thursday. I've got these hours now.